Praise the Lord. The creator of life believes in the sanctity of life. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless Life Network and also to bless his word this morning. Join me, please. Father, we thank you so much for the just privilege we have to come alongside Life Network, Lord, and, and to support them. We pray, Father, that you would uh, continue to bless them. Father, help us to continue our support, not only financially, but prayerfully, Lord, to pray for this ministry that not only rescues the lives of the unborn, but also, Father, the lives of the moms and dads who come in. Father, we pray today that you would bless, Lord, um, your word. Your word would go forth, Lord, with your promise, that it will not return void, but accomplish that which you send it to do. And we just simply ask that you'd give us hearts, ears to hear, and hearts to receive your word, that we might magnify you, we might know you even more. We give this, give this time to you and ask that you would be glorified in it, Father. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. We are in Joshua chapter 1, and uh, I am definitely taking my time. Hallelujah. And we'll be looking at verses 5 to 9 today. And uh, I remember years ago, uh, uh, it was Pastor Chuck Smith, anyway, some of you know who he is, but uh, he would go to one verse and spend 45 minutes on that verse. And I go, wow, how do you do that? And uh, now I know how. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, we're looking at verses 5 to 9, and the, the series of messages, the series in, is entitled, Through the Book of Joshua, Courageous Warrior, and we're going to talk about the warrior's mentality today, which is so important. Every athlete will tell you that uh, attitude, uh, your mental health is, is, is essential, is important to your, your preparation. Any athlete will tell you that. That is very important uh, for you. Uh, to compete. And uh, they're ch challenge. Athletes are challenged with all type of challenges all the time, and they really need to be in good mental uh, shape, have a good attitude because of those challenges. And I was reading an article here recently, and um, it, it mentioned some of the challenges that these athletes face, and here's a few of them. One is coping with pain and injuries. The other is dealing with adversity. Thirdly, multitasking sports with other life responsibilities and tasks. And lastly, making daily decisions relating to integrity and responsibility. And I thought about those in the spiritual sense that spiritually we can relate to these as believers. Because do we not uh, uh, have to cope with pain at times and, and, and uh, you know, injuries, if you will, spiritual injuries? I know some of you may have limped in here uh, today with an injury, you know, in your heart or whatever, but the Lord is with you. And there's times that we have to face adversity as believers and times that we have to multitask and we feel sometimes overwhelmed and times when we have to make decisions every day regarding our integrity and responsibilities in Christ. So as a believer, if it's important for an athlete to have a, a, uh, a uh, healthy mentality, in preparation to compete, how much more is it for us as believers to have a healthy mentality in our walk with Christ? It's very important, I would say. Last week we saw where God had commissioned Joshua to uh, cross over the Jordan to lead the children of Israel over the Jordan to the land of promise, the land of Canaan. And today we will look at the fact that the Lord says not only is it important to lead them over Joshua, but also, to lead him over with the right attitude, the right mentality, as we would get into God's Word here. So we begin here at verses 5 and 6, and where the Lord charges him to cross over with the right uh, mentality. And so the Word of God says, no man, verse 5, Joshua chapter 1, he says to Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Let's stop there. Let's look at this charge that the Lord is giving to Joshua. Really, it's, a, it's, it's really a charge to live according to legacy. Legacy, you could say, is a warrior's spiritual mentality. Legacy inspires the athlete to compete. If your school has been number one in 
basketball or whatever, you, you want to play, you want to live up to that legacy. If you're, and, and legacy is, is what inspires the soldier to serve. You want to, you know, live out the legacy or, or you know, perform in a way that's, that uh, carries on the legacy of your unit or what have you. Uh, I've had friends, uh, had friends, I, mean, I still have friends, amen, but uh, <laughs> people that, uh, guys that have served in, in, the, in the United States Marines, and I don't know if there's any former Marines or currently serving Marines here, but a friend of mine told me, he was a pastor, he said, once a Marine, always a Marine. I'm like, dude, the war's over. He's like, you know, you're, you're a pastor, you love people, he, he'll take you out, though. I mean, he's got to take you out. I mean, just, he still kind of got that Marine men mentality within him, and because of the legacy of the Marine Corps. And, uh, you know, for us as Christians, God reminds uh, Joshua here of his legacy, not Joshua's legacy, but God's legacy of faithfulness. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Amen. Legacy, the legacy of God is the warrior's spiritual mentality. We love to talk about those that the Lord used in the Old Testament, the New Testament, great men and women of God down through the years. We like to read about their lives. We like to study the Word and preach and study the great accounts and stories and Scripture and all that's great. But I think sometimes in our own hearts we feel like that's, that was for them, but it's not for me. Now somehow God has changed. He doesn't do that anymore. But the reality is that God has not changed. Amen? Malachi chapter 3 says, the Lord God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Amen? Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. We are not consumed this morning in Christ because God does not change. He's never stopped loving you. He never stopped caring for you. Amen? God changes not. Men change. Hairstyles change. Thank God fashions change from the 70s. Amen. <laughs> Things change. People change. They like you one day, they hate you the next. But God never changes. Aren't you glad about that today? The legacy, the faithfulness of God should be an inspiration really to all of us as we study through the book of Joshua. I want you, don't forget that as we go through the book of Joshua. We're going to be in Joshua for a long time. Like, hey, man, strap yourself in, get comfortable. <laughs> But as we go through this book, remember, we're not just looking at these great stories, but the same God that was with Moses, that was with Joshua, is the same God that is with you. He changes not. Therefore, be strong and of good courage. And, uh, G, I mean, the, the, the Lord God said to Joshua, be strong. Be strong. What does it mean to be strong? It's, it, to be strong is not some instantaneous thing. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's not what the Lord is saying. Be strong. When you study the, the word, that phrase, be strong, in Hebrew, the word there that's given for be strong in, in the Hebrew language, or language of the, the Old Testament, it means to strengthen, it means to harden, it means to become strong, it means to grow firm, resolve, listen to this, to be sore. Amen? To be sore. Why would it say that? Because it's a process. Being strong in the Lord. Exercise can make you sore. Amen. Somebody ought to be saying amen. No, nobody's saying amen because we're not exercising. Amen. That's how I guess right. No. No, exercise will make you sore. The old sports adage is true. No pain, huh. no gain. Amen. And we want to have gain, but we don't want any pain. And spiritually speaking, you know, temptations and trials. Similar to, if you will, weightlifting may make you sore. We may have to suffer. We go through things, amen? But the workout, if you will, is necessary for our spiritual development in Christ. You say, well, I don't know about that, Pastor. I don't think God wants me to go through a tough time. God doesn't want me to suffer. But without resistance... Talk to anybody that trains with weights, your muscles get stronger because of resistance. When you pull that 130 pounds off that bench, it's coming down to your chest, hey man. You know, that's, that's resistance. You've got to push through that resistance. It's the same thing in going through temptations and through trials in our lives. 
you know. And, uh, you know, you want to be careful about that. But you know what? That's, that's it's the same principle applies. If there's no resistance, you can do this all day long to the air. But until you put some weight on, the, on, on that weight bar, only then can you really grow strong. And so God allows those trials and tribulations many times in our life, not because he likes to see us suffer so that you can become strong, that you might become resolved. Now, James knew this. This is why James said, you know, every time we read this in James, we think James is out of his mind, but he was speaking truth. James chapter 1, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing, the resistance to your faith, of your faith, produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count it all joy that there's resistance. You have to push through that trial, push through that temptation, push through that resistance so that you can become strong. You might have patience and grow in the Lord. Now Joshua, again, here in our text, really, when you think about it, has been prepared by the Lord for this very moment. Think about it. Joshua was with Moses in the wilderness. He served Moses in the wilderness 40 years. And you know, uh, he, he, I'm sure during that 40-year period, there are times that he thought, what is God doing? I don't understand why we have to go through this. I, the, the people, the Bible says, murmured and complained, remember, against Moses. And now Joshua is his assistant, and so they probably murmured and complained to him and hoped that he would tell Moses. Maybe going to Joshua saying, you know what, uh, can, can, you, can you, you know, pass this on to Moses? Can you... You know, can you do something about Moses? I don't like the way he's doing it. They would complain to him. Like, a lot of times people won't complain to the pastor, but they'll complain to his assistants, and some even to his own wife. <laughs> and hope that, hope that it would get to the pastor. Amen. Amen. People do that. I, I, know, it, I know it happens. And, and, and imagine Joshua being in that position as an assistant. He was probably catching a lot of fly. The people would complain. They wouldn't tell Moses, but they would tell Joshua. So he was in a situation where he was going through a very difficult time in the wilderness, and yet he served there and probably wondered, Lord, what are you doing? I don't understand why we have to go this route. What, why these trials and all? The Bible doesn't speak about it, but Joshua was just a, a man, a person like us, just a regular guy that God was using. But it's the same with us, isn't it? Is it not? Times in our lives where we go, Lord, I'm in the wilderness. Why is this? Why did you make, turn this way? Why did you close that door? Why did you, God, I don't know what you're doing. And we get frustrated with the Lord many times, do we not? Let me tell you what's happening. I'll put it to you this way, that the trials we face today are fashioning us for the faith we will exercise tomorrow. God is preparing you for something. The trials we face today is fashioning us to exercise the faith that we will live out tomorrow. What Joshua was going through in the wilderness was preparing him for this very moment. I look at my life and I think of the things how God molded my mind even before I came to Christ. How God enabled me through my father's career who was in the army. We moved around a lot and, and I was used to being in different situations, being around all types of, you know, ethnicities and, and different people and all that. And I believe he's preparing me to pastor this church. I didn't know it at the time. Because I'll be quite honest with you, some people who walk into a room of, of other people that are not their color and are intimidated. And they feel, oh, you know, even in church sometimes, you know, <laughs> it, it, it goes both ways. You have, you know, a black person walks into an all-white church, everybody turns around and looks at it. What's he doing here? Uh, or white person walks in all black church, what's he here for? Amen. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. You know how we do. All right. And, but, but the Lord has blessed me to be able to, to be, a, 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 you know, even before I came to the Lord, all manner of ethnicities and different people and all. And so, it, you know, I, I fully expected God to do what he has done. You know, because he had prepared me for this very moment. And then all the trials and the tribulations and things in your life, you're going, God, where were you? And I don't know well, why, why this is happening and all of this. And now as I look back, I can say God was preparing and molding me 
for this very time. Thank God for his faithfulness. Amen. Give him praise and glory. But we give God glory, but give God glory in your own life. The things that you've gone through have made you the person you are today so that God might use you in situations that he can't use maybe somebody else. And so he prepared Joshua for this very moment. God allows trials in my life. I don't like it. Amen. I don't know anybody who says, oh, I love trials. I mean, of course, James said he did, but it's James. What are you going to say? Anyway, but, uh, but anytime you see anybody, trials like exercise, you know, it's just like physically we don't want to exercise. Trials can be like exercise. It's something you just don't want to do, but you know you have to do it if you're going to get stronger. You see anybody on television that's smiling and they're working out, they're lying to you. <laughs> if, you're, if you're really working out, if you're really working out, man, it's, it's, it's grueling. I remember I used to jog with a good friend of mine. He's in heaven now, but, you know, he'd be talking to me the whole time we're jogging, and I just want to stop and slap him. Because, <laughs> dude, I can't answer you. I'm trying to breathe. I'm having trouble breathing and thinking about what you're saying and trying to give you an answer. I just can't, couldn't do that. Amen. So it's grueling sometimes, but God sends testing and trials in our lives many times to strengthen, if you will, our spiritual abs, our spiritual biceps and triceps, etc. Amen. To strengthen us that we might benefit. What's he strengthening us for? That he might deliver us, that we might be overcomers, I should say, when it comes to the fear of man. He makes you strong in him so that we will serve him rather than serve out of the fear of men. So verse 5, the first part of verse 5, the Lord talks about the very fact. He says, Joshua, I want you to know no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just be strong in me and of good courage. Proverbs 29 tells us that the fear of the Lord, the fear of man, rather, brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. We can't enter into the promises of God. We can't possess the land. We can't be what God has called us to be if we fear people. You can't serve the fear of man and the fear and, and walk in the fear of God. There's just no way you can, you know, you can please both. You try to please everybody, you're going to not please anybody, <laughs> you know. Please God. And Joshua could not take the land by himself. He surely couldn't take the land if he feared men. What was waiting for Joshua in the land? Well, we know that the rich and the powerful, the affluent, the strong in stature occupied the land and there's no way Joshua was going to be able to take the land in his own strength. He didn't match up, but he could through the power of God. Why? Because God was his personal, co his personal strength coach. Amen. They have strength coaches on football teams and other sports and they teach you how to get strong. God is our personal strength coach. And Joshua, you can take this, but be strong in me, not in yourself. And so he was, and he did prevail. We know at Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, right? Through Christ who what? Strengthens me. Christ is my strength coach. He's strengthening us. What you're going through right now, he is strengthening you so that you can be strong in the Lord and of good courage, amen, in our Lord and Savior for his glory. So Joshua, the Lord ex exhorts him and says, I was with Moses and I will also be with you. And as he remembered Moses, as Joshua remembered Moses, he remembered God's power when God parted the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went across, the Bible says, on dry land. When he remembered Moses, Moses, he remembered that God is faithful to guide him. As God provided the pillar of cloud by day that led the children of Israel and the pillar of fire by night that led the children of Israel. God is the God who will lead me. He will guide me. As he remembered Moses, he remembered God as a provider, God's provision. As God rained down manna from heaven that the children of Israel might have something to eat. As he remembered Moses, he remembered God's presence on top of Mount Sinai when Moses went to receive the law from the Lord. And Sinai was full of fire and smoke, representing the awesome presence of God. So all these things he remembered, that's why he called him, said, uh, uh, God 
told Joshua to remember Moses because remember all the things I did for Moses, I will do the same thing for you. God's power will do the same thing for you. God will be, will give, be the power in your life. He will give you power and strength. The Bible says to those who have no strength, God gives them strength. Amen? He will be a guidance to you. His, his word is a lamp to your feet, a light to your path. He will be the God who provides for you. He's Jehovah Jireh. He'll meet our needs above and beyond even what we can ask or think. Amen. He's a God of presence. In other words, in the spirit of the Lord, in your presence, Lord, is the fullness of joy at your right hand or pleasures forevermore. This is the God who is calling you to be strong and of good courage. For as he was with Moses, he was with Joshua. As he was with Joshua, he is with you. Do you believe that? Oh, he did it for Moses and Joshua, but not for me. No, he'll do it for you too. Amen. Give him praise and glory. Amen. The remembrance, the legacy of God's faithfulness to Moses caused Joshua to have an attitude adjustment. Be strong and of good courage. When we remember the faithfulness of God, it should change, alter our attitude. I know what I'm facing, but I'm, I'm the God of Moses and Joshua. He is with me, and he promised he would never leave me or forsake me. God is with us. God is with you. And because God, because I'm strong in the Lord, the second thing, the second part of that exhortation is be strong, but also and of good courage. I can have good courage today. Now, what does that phrase, good courage, mean in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word for the phrase good courage, it means to be alert, to have mental courage. Think of it this way, and it's so true. When I'm strong in the Lord, I'm in my right mind. My mind is right when I'm strong in the Lord. The foolishness of the world and the lies and deceit of the world have no place when I'm strong in in the Lord. And one of the benefits of working out when I was a, used to be a gym rat, amen, I always at the gym when I was a young man, amen, not anymore. And uh, one of the benefits, man, I, I just love it when you have a, I worked out probably almost a couple hours, you hit the showers and, oh man, you felt just great, your mind was sharper and all that. Same thing spiritually, when you're strong in the Lord, You've worked out, amen. You're walking with God. Your, your mind is right. You think clear. There's just more resolve. You have mental clarity. You have good courage. Good courage. And when I'm walking with good courage, the darts of the enemy that are always flying about cannot penetrate my heart as it could in times when I wasn't walking with the Lord when I wasn't strong in the Lord, but I was strong in my flesh. And those darts of the enemy get sink down deep into my mind and my heart, ruin your whole day. But when you're strong in the Lord, those darts of the enemy can be quenched. Why? Because I've got the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, and the shield of faith in God's word. Amen. I'm in my right mind and the helmet, if you will, of salvation, part of the armor of God. And when I'm in good courage... What does it mean to have good courage, to be mentally, to have mental clarity in the Lord, to be alert in the Lord? When I have good courage, I have the courage to forgive offenses. I have the courage to allow the love and the grace and, 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 and the mercy of God to flow through my life to other people. It takes courage to love. It takes courage to forgive. And a lot of Christians do not have the courage to do that because they're not strong first in the Lord. This is good courage. Courage that magnifies and glorifies the Lord and not our flesh. And because Joshua had good courage, God could entrust to him great things. So therefore, in verse 6, he says, It's up to you, Joshua, to divide the land as an inheritance among the children of Israel. God gave him that responsibility. God gives great responsibility to those who have good courage, those who are strong in him. Amen? Sin, however, sin 
has an opposite effect, the opposite effect on our minds and our hearts, our lives. The opposite effect of good courage. Sin promotes instability. It, it promotes cowardice in our lives. James tells us in James chapter 4, he said, draw near to God. And you know what? God will draw near to you. The Lord's not resisting you. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the fact that the thing that divides us or, or, or causes us to have this double-mindedness and to not really believe God fully is the fact that we are we're walking in sin. And so repent of those things so that you might draw near to God, and God draw near, draws near to you. Do not have a double mind. Sin gives us a divided mind. But good courage, <laughs> good courage, mental clarity is evidence of a godly mind. A mind ready and set to please the Lord. And this is the case with Joshua. Now we move on to verses 7 and 8 where in Joshua chapter 1 when the Bible says, the Lord says to Joshua, only be strong and very courageous. Emphasis on very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law, that is God's word, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now let's unpack this a little bit. What is the Lord saying here to Joshua? Be strong in the Lord, but, with very, but be very courageous in his word. Be strong in the Lord and of good courage. Be strong in the Lord and be very, why the emphasis on very courageous? Because he's talking about his word. It takes great courage today to live according to the word of God. It's not just a little courage, but it takes great courage. Be very courageous. And I believe in every generation God has a remnant, and I believe God is raising up, even in the younger generation, young people who are very courageous about keeping the word of God. They don't get the press and all that, but they're out there. And they're very courageous about serving the Lord. That word very in Hebrew, it means mighty, to be, it means force, it means abundance. To be forceful, you have to be aggressive to keep God's word today. There's so many lies out there in the world. It's easy to be deceived unless we keep the word of God. Hold fast to his word, to his truth. And we have here within our text, we just read it, four ways given here by which we can be very courageous. I call them four focus factors because I watch the commercials, amen? Focus factors, you know, is that the drug you're supposed to take and the pill or whatever that helps you, your clarity of mind and all that, amen? Uh, I think I need a whole bottle some days. But there are four focus factors I want to draw your attention to for us to, how can we live today in this present age with, in a very courageous way in relationship to the Word of God? Here are four things that the Lord God has given to Joshua. The first factor is this, do not turn to the right or to the left. He tells them that there in verse 7, the latter part, do not turn to the right or to the left. I would say in today's modern day vernacular, do not turn to the right wing or the left wing. Amen. Politics on the right side or the left side. Now, there's nothing wrong in your political affiliation. That's your own choice. But don't let that become the very thing you depend upon. Make sure your focus is on the Lord. Do not turn to the right or to the left, but keep your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. 
Wherefore, seeing we are encompassed about by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sins that doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising his shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep your eye on the prize. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't turn to the left or to the right if you want to keep the word of God. And then, of course, he said the second factor is keep God's word in your mouth. Amen. So important. Don't let this word uh, leave your mouth. Keep that word in your mouth. It's so important because what's in our mouth is evidence of what's in our heart. What's in your mouth is evidence of what's in your heart. The Bible tells us, as Jesus said, actually, (laughs) For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of our heart, we speak. And so we think things coming out of our mouth. We go, ah, oh, uh, I didn't mean that, you know. <laughs> but if it's in your mouth, then it must have been in your heart. Guard your heart. Keep the word of God in your mouth. Speaking the word of God one to another. The third factor, if you will, is let your mind, to be very courageous, is let your mind meditate on the Word. Meditate upon the Word. Here's another adage to go along with that. What we think about is what we will soon act out. What we think about, we will soon act out. That which you meditate upon all the time, you'll soon act out. If you're meditating on some other illicit relationship in your marriage, you keep meditating on that, you'll soon act that out. What you meditate on, what you think about, you will soon act act out so therefore meditate upon the word the bible tells us in colossians chapter 3 verse 16 let the word of god dwell within you richly and then of course the lord tells joshua dwell and med- meditate upon the word dwell upon the word day and night amen a, a great habit for us as believers is yes read the word of god in the morning Read it at night, too. That's a great habit to have. But meditate upon God's Word. Let God's Word have dominion in the day and in the night. Colossians 3.16, let His Word dwell within you richly. Here's the fourth focus factor, if you will, to live a life that's very courageous in the Word. That is to observe to do the Word. Tells them that there in, in verse 8, the latter part of verse 8. Do the word. Make sure you observe. Not just know the word, but also do the word of God. James chapter 1, verse 22. Would he, uh, but rather be doers, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Amen. And truly, that's what we do. We deceive ourselves. When we're, we just know the word, but we won't do the word. I was talking to a gentleman the other night, and uh, the other day, and, you know, he's, he and his wife have been separated for a long time. And he's trying to reconcile. She is not involved with somebody or whatever, but the reality is she won't seek any type of reconciliation. Now, again, I'm not going into the details. Of, I don't know, need to know all the details and all this, but I've seen Christian couples do this. And she'll move out, the wife will move out, her husband, whatever, and they're just kind of living their own life. They may not be any involvement with anybody. They think, well, I'm, I'm righteous, you know, because I haven't been with anybody. I'm righteous because I'm not really take, dragging that person, my spouse, in the court and all this. But if you know the word, which says the two shall become one flesh, if you know the word that our relationship with our spouse should be as a relationship of Jesus and the church, Amen. If you know that and you don't do that, then you're kind of creating your own righteousness. You're making up your own standard for righteousness. Today. Well, I'm, at least I'm not doing this and that and the other. No, God wants you to obey all his word. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and do not do the things I ask? So we can't use that as an excuse. You know what to do right. And then, of course, the scripture says, he who knows to do right and who doesn't do it, to him it is sin. 
If you know you're supposed to be with your spouse, you know you're supposed to be reconciling, if you know you're supposed to be as one and, and your marriage to glorify the Lord, and you resist that, I don't care if you are, you know, living celibate or whatever. You're not home. Oh, it got quiet. That's all right. <laughs> be doers of the word. You don't know the word until you do the word. Anybody can preach the word. But it takes someone very courageous to do the word. To do what the Lord has asked. Amen. All right. Now, in verses 7 and 8, <laughs> being very courageous, living according to God's word, yields great benefits. There the Lord says, then you will prosper, then you will have good success. You want to be prosperous in life as a believer? Keep the word of God. There's a promise that goes along with it. So we'll stop there at verse 9. And verse 9, actually, I'm using as, stop here at verse 9. Verse 9, I'm using as a conclusion to the matter. And here in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, the word of God says, and this is what the Lord is saying to Joshua. And take these words to your own heart, to your own self today. Well, the Lord says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. David said, if I make my bed in hell, Lord, you're there. Where can I go from the presence of the Lord? Where can we run? You can run, but you can't hide. Amen. God is with us wherever we are. That's, that's, a, that's a great promise that wherever I am, you may have lived in one state before, now you're here and maybe having a tough time, whatever, God is here with you. Wherever we go, whatever job you go to or what have you, the Lord promises to be there. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. What a glorious promise we have. And so he exhorts Joshua. He says, have I not commanded you? I think that sometimes, many times, not sometimes, many times in my life, <laughs> if I can use myself as an example, sometimes I've kind of wrestling with the Lord and arguing with the Lord. And it's like the Lord saying, have I not commanded you? That's where it should end, right? Sometimes we continue to kind of push back on what the Lord has said or whatever, but we can't win, amen? As the old saying goes, you can't box with God. His arms, your arms are too short, amen? I mean, he can reach out and, and tag you all the way from glory, amen? His arms are just that long. Have I not commanded you? Do not be afraid. What has he commanded him? Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. I know we're all tempted with fear. We live in a culture of fear today. But a warrior's mentality, someone who's strong in the Lord, does not succumb to a culture of fear. And I've had to say many times to this congregation, to myself, especially during this whole pandemic thing, that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but that of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? And yet we find many believers afraid, living in fear. And the devil's not afraid. To read about the church of Satan having a conference they're putting on down in Scottsdale, Arizona in February. It's called SatanCon. That's the name of it. SatanCon. The devil is so brash. His followers aren't afraid. What do we have to fear? Amen? Well, it's time for us to rise up as believers and to be strong in the Lord and of good courage. Now, the devil's always up to his antics. Who cares? He's already defeated. But some believers have succumbed to an atmosphere, a society of fear. They're not witnessing, not fellowshipping, walking in fear. Who gave you that spirit? 
Not the God who said, have I not commanded you? Amen. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but that of power, love, and a sound mind. He says, do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed, afraid to be literally terrified, dismayed, to be beaten down and shattered. That's where the devil wants you living. But it's not where God has called us. Not where he called Joshua, it's not where he called us. This week we will be celebrating the life of a man to me who was a, had a warrior mentality, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And he went through a lot. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe he had a warrior mentality. It cost him his life. But it brought liberty and freedom. Exposed the injustice in America against a certain class, race of people, I should say. And not just African Americans, but all people. Those impoverished. He was for all the people. But he was a warrior. He had to have a warrior mentality to have a dream. We need to be warriors as well for Christ. Not just in the church, but in the community. And we have the promise of God that as we take up the banner of the gospel, as we take on the mentality of a warrior and trust in God and the things that he has commanded us, God promised that he would be for us, that he would help us, that he would strengthen us. I love what it says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3. It's not on the screen, so write this down and listen carefully. But Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 3, the it ends at the first, in the first half of verse 3. But here's what the Lord God said. He says, but now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob. He's speaking to Israel, but put your name in there. Who has created you. And he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. God knows your name. Isn't that rich? You are mine. God makes a declaration there. You are mine. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to the world. You don't belong to the devil. You don't belong to the opinions of men. You belong to me. You are mine. Amen? <laughs> and he said, when you pass through the waters... I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God. Amen. I love that. It's personal. God takes it personal. Whatever you are going through, it's personal to him. He said, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Put your hope in that. Put your trust in that. Man, understanding that the Lord is for me. He is my God. My, he has redeemed me. I belong to him. You are mine, says the Lord. He knows exactly what you're going through and where you are. All he wants you to do is have faith to believe him. Listen, faith is of us. We have to have faith to put our faith in God. But the ability is of God. He wants to see our faith. And here God is asking Joshua and, and, and encouraging Joshua, show me your faith. Put your faith in me. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and very courageous in my word, and I'll do the rest. And as we go through the book of Joshua, we'll see, indeed, the Lord God did. A warrior's mentality like that of Joshua and even that of Dr. King. It inspired a whole nation. Joshua's warrior mentality inspired Israel to cross over. And Dr. King's warrior mentality, if you will, his trust in God, it inspired a nation, our nation. The strength 
of a warrior's mentality of faith, because that's what it is. This is really a mentality of faith. The strength of that mentality is found in God's faithfulness, and his legacy is what we lean upon. That's where we draw our strength from, what the Lord has done. And this is exactly where Joshua got his strength, by remembering the faithfulness of God. Some of us may feel like, well, you know, it's, I'm, I'm too weak, pastor, and, and all. But faith in his ability will bring healing to your life. Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down. And the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Amen. God will heal those the weaknesses and the things. You know, our hands, some believers, our hands are hanging down. They don't think God loves them anymore. Their knees are feeble with doubt and, and fear. Their paths are crooked because they're so back and forth. They're not following the Lord. And how do we strengthen our hands? How do we strengthen our knees and make our path straight? By returning to our first love. By admitting to God, I can't do it. It wasn't Joshua pulling himself up by his bootstraps, but by putting his faith in what God had commanded. Amen? If we would do that, my friend, we can be strong and of good courage. Father, we thank you for your word today. Help us, Lord, in our lives to not just cross over, but to cross over with the right attitude. Our faith fully in who you are. Faith fully in your legacy, not our own. There may be someone here today that you do not know Jesus Christ. You're watching online. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You say, well, why do I need to? Why is it so important? Well, because one out of one person dies. And each one of us, I don't care who you are, how great you are, your mouth one day will be silent and you will stand in the presence of God. question is, where will you stand? Will you stand in a place of condemnation because of your sins or will you stand in a place of no condemnation because you received Christ, and you put your faith in what he has done for you on the cross. What did he do for you on the cross? He died. He took your punishment upon himself so that you might be free from all condemnation and stand in the presence of God, forgiven, and have everlasting life. The Pastor Al, I, I, I want to know God's forgiveness. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know I'm on my way to heaven. If that's your heart's desire, you're watching online, you're here today, simply bow your head. Wherever you are at home or watching or, or here in this auditorium upstairs in the overflow, would you just bow your head right now and repeat this prayer after me? Simply say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins, all of them. And I believe that you are risen from the dead. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life and change me. I receive you today as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. My friend, I have you pray that way, not to me, but from your mouth to the very heart of God. He has heard you. And the Bible says that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart God has raised us from the dead, that you have been born again. You are now a child of God because your faith is in Christ. And I want to be the first to welcome you to the family of God. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord.